In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Quick question before we start. Um, who here considers themselves very pragmatic, very logical, very like, kind of this makes sense, we'll go through it this way? All right, good. <laughs> okay, good. I'm not one of those people, I'm just encouraging you to raise your hands. I'm totally not pragmatic, um, if you have my wife, like she will attest to this. But um, this sermon's for you. But don't worry, if you're like me, there are other sermons for people like us, okay? So what is it to be pragmatic, all right? It's, it's to be somebody who looks at things sensibly in a realistic way, and they look at that rather than looking at the theoretical or the ideological way, right? They kind of look at things and say like, okay, what do I have? What are my resources? You know, how am I going to get through this? And if I can't do it, I'm going to take another route, right? That's being very practical right? Being very practical. And oftentimes, like, pragmatic people tend to live in a certain zone, right? There's, there's a certain safety zone that they live in. And when they go outside of the safety zone, right, where, you know, the logic and the reason and the resources, you know, aren't as much, it gets a little bit harder for them to function, okay? And they tend to also look at people like me, all right? It was totally not, you know, pragmatic as impractical, which I've definitely been called, okay? Um, idealistic, and other names I've been called are unrealistic, right? So these are names that I've been called because I am not a pragmatic person at all, right? And, and so when we see this, all right, there, you know, there's beauties to this sort of way of seeing things, right, and functioning, and there's also shadows to it. And on the flip side, right, if you're kind of in the camp of unrealistic and ideological, like which is where I sit, right, there's beautiful things there and there's shadows to it as well, right? But for the sake of today, we're sticking with those who consider themselves very practical individuals because in the spirit of what we've been doing for Bible study, which is looking at the disciples, right, we have um, a disciple that we're going to focus on today because he pops up and he kind of takes center stage in, in the miracle of today. And that disciples Philip, right? And what we've done with each of the disciples that we've studied during our Bible study is we, we kind of look and say, well, what are all the pieces of scripture that we have about this, this one individual, right? We know collectively what the disciples did, but what we have about the disciples very, as individuals is actually very, very little. And so when we have a story of today, which uh, Philip is in, you know, it's one of the main stories that teaches us something about Philip. And so to kind of quickly um, talk about a little bit of Philip's background, well, there isn't much that we know other than he was likely a fisherman because he was from the same city as Peter and Andrew, and they, they knew each other. And we think, though we don't know for certain, that he was a disciple of John the Baptist, right? So in kind of putting that together, fishermen, but he was, you know, somewhere around like the area in the, uh, of John the Baptist, kind of following his ministry and, and, and so on. But we don't know what that actually looked like and how close he was, but we just, we think, okay? That's about all we know about Philip. We don't know anything about his family, brothers, sisters, anything like that. That's it. Okay? That's it. Now, when we look at Philip, he was called in a very interesting way. Now, when we look at the Gospel of John, it gives us an account of how some of the disciples were called. And just prior to the calling of Philip, Peter and Andrew were called, where actually Andrew kind of figured out who Jesus was because John the Baptist was saying, this is the one I was telling you about. And Andrew went and got his brother Peter and said, look, this is, this is the Messiah, let's go, right? So we learned a lot about Andrew. We talked about Andrew in Bible studies. We're not talking about him today. But then right after uh, Andrew and Peter began to follow, the Lord went out, okay? The Lord went out, and we're in John chapter 1, and 43 and 45 really captures um, the calling of, of Philip. And he says, the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, right, which is a little bit further out from the Sea of Galilee, and he found Philip, and he said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, which is how we believe that they, they know each other. 
And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him whose Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth the son of Joseph. All right, so when we look at, at this calling of Philip, Philip goes and tells his friend Nathanael, and Philip gives a very practical explanation to Nathanael as to why to come and follow Jesus. Right? It's very practical. The law, Moses spoke in the law about this one to come. The prophets also talked about this one. He was very practical. He wasn't like wowed by, by like some big miracle, or at least we don't get a sense of that right, from this. He wasn't wowed by anything, but he heard Jesus. He had a conversation with him, and then he started to become very practical and be like, oh, the law said this, and you said this. Okay, the prophet said this, you did this. Like, it makes sense. All right, it was a very practical approach. To him. And that's how he presented it to Nathaniel. So when we look at Philip, we learn a little bit about how he functions, how he thinks. And how he thinks, there's a beautiful side to it, right? Because clearly how he thinks led him to follow Christ, right? There was, there was a, a higher brain function that, that was happening in Philip for how he ended up following Christ. But the full weight of what it meant to follow Christ hadn't hit Philip. And if we kind of fast forward a little bit, a couple of miracles had happened until we get to the gospel of today, which is John chapter 6, which is where we're talking about the feeding of the 5,000. So Philip, up to this point, has witnessed other miracles. Okay, Definitely the wedding of Canaan of Galilee and likely other miracles. All right, So he has witnessed things. But now, the Lord is going to test Philip. We pick it up where the gospel began today. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing the great multitude coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he was about to do. Philip answered him, well, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for them that every one of them may have a little. This is where the pragmatic individuals struggle to follow. Okay? This is where the pragmatic individuals struggle to follow. And like I said, the sermon's for you. There are other sermons for me. Okay? I have my own struggles. And people who are unrealistic, we have our own struggles in following the Lord. Okay? The pragmatic people struggle in this sense because... He would never put himself in this situation, right? Very few people would put themselves in this situation. Given the options, most people don't want to be in this situation. Other would be like, some people would be like, this is way too much work to try and feed 5,000 just men. That's not including the women and the children who are also, you know, in, in the multitude. Other people would look at it from a responsibility standpoint, like, I'm not taking responsibility for this many people. Philip looked at the situation and be like, the numbers don't make sense. We are not going to be in this situation. Right? Because even his response was, he was trying to figure it out. And he tried to calculate. And he's like, okay, 200 denarii isn't going to be enough. Tells us more about how Philip thinks. So while being pragmatic can save us from certain situations, it can also rob us of other experiences. While being pragmatic saves us from certain situations and being in you know, situations that aren't in our favor, they can also rob us of different experiences. Because the Lord wanted to test Philip and he was testing the way that he thought and testing the way that he was processing everything. And the Lord wanted Philip to take a step, just like he wanted all the disciples, but Philip was highlighted in, in, in the gospel of today. He wanted Philip to take a step. And that step was kind of taking him out of what was logical, what was you know, comfortable, what was safe. And he put him in another situation. Put him in a situation where he felt helpless. Okay, we don't have enough money. Felt foolish, like, okay, why would we be in a deserted place and not have enough resources? Right? And a bit bewildered on how are we going to do this? But it's right here, 
right? It's in that place of where we feel helpless sometimes. We feel bewildered. We feel even foolish of like, oh my gosh, how did I get into this situation? It's there when we are walking with God that God really begins to reveal himself to us, right? Philip understood, okay, he was the Messiah. But did he really understand? No, none of the disciples really understood who the Messiah was. They didn't understand the full extent of who he was and what his ability to was. Even though, okay, they saw water turn into wine. They sang, saw a blind man see. They saw him talk to a Samaritan woman. They saw him do different things, right? Have, you know, perform different miracles. But the full extent of what he was able to do was still being uncovered by them. And he would, Philip, as well as many of the disciples, would not figure it out, would not be able to experience it, right? And begin to internalize it until they're in a situation that is outside of their comfort zone outside of the way they function. And this is where the Lord put Philip, right? The Lord wanted to take Philip and say, okay, your logic led you to me. Your mind led you to me. But now I want your heart because it's gonna take you a bit further. I wanna remove the crutch that you have, okay? There's beauty to it, but there's also a shadow to it. Now I need to remove it in order to take you deeper into a relationship with me. And this would continue on in the life of Philip, right? Philip would learn from this situation, but yet he didn't learn the full extent of it. He was still growing in his relationship with God. And if we go towards the Last Supper, we get our last glimpse of Philip where he speaks by himself, right? Where he speaks by himself. And in the Last Supper, there's a long discourse in John uh, 14, 15, 16, and 17. All right, And in this discourse with Jesus praying with his disciples there, the Lord says this, John chapter 6, I'm going to read 6 through 10. He says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would also known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. So what is the Lord saying? Is that me and the Father are one. If you see me, you see the Father. If you follow me, you follow the Father. It's actually very, very logical what the Lord is saying. But Philip enters in, verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Clearly didn't see anything that the Lord was teaching. Right? Totally missed it. Totally missed it. Lord, show us the Father, and it's sufficient for us. And the Lord responds. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. All right? The Lord is actually very logical in his response. But Philip, with the way that he thinks, right, the way that he processes, was struggling Right? struggling to, to cross that last bridge, to really understand and experience the Lord. And in experiencing the Lord, he was experiencing the Father. <clears throat> For each one of us, we have to look at the way that we think and the way that we process and the way that we, you know, the lens through which we see the world. And there's two things that we have to do. We have to appreciate the beauty of it, right? Because the diversity in the way that we all see is what brings richness to, to the community and to the world, right? There is a beauty in the diversity. Each of us have to see the way, the lens through which I see the world, the way in which I perceive. But at the same time, we have to appreciate the beauty. We have to be able to acknowledge the shadows to the way that we see, right? the Achilles heel to the way that we function, the crutches that we hold on to. That when, when we're unable to go beyond what is comfortable, we miss an experience with the Lord, right? We highlighted what it looks like if you're very pragmatic, but everybody, nobody is exempt from challenging the way that they see the world, right? Challenging the way that they see the Lord. The Lord is always trying to bring us out of our comfort zone and take us into an area in which we're not familiar with, we don't really know how to, to, to process, 
And there he wants to meet us. And there he wants to teach us. And it's there, okay, when we feel helpless, when we feel like we're, you know, confused and lost, that's where the Lord finds us. And that's when the true relationship really begins. Right? Sorry, I don't like the way that I said that. I don't want to say that's where it really begins. Right? Because we're always growing in our relationship. What I want to say more is that this is where our relationship deepens. Okay? Not begins, but it deepens. It becomes more personal. So when all of us are challenged in ways and we feel uncomfortable, we feel helpless, or we feel confused, instead of retreating back to what is comfortable to us, and instead of retreating back to only seeing the situation through the way that like, I like to see the situation, we need to ask ourselves, is the Lord challenging me to take a step? And likely he is. It's challenging us to take a step in which, right, like Philip felt when asked, how do we feed 5,000? He felt hopeless, he felt confused, he felt bewildered, felt uncomfortable. It's right there that the Lord is really deepening our relationship with him, where he wants to show us something unique, and he wants us to draw closer to him. But it always comes at the edge of, of kind of what we're used to or how we like to see things. Can we allow the Lord to challenge us to go further? And in challenging us to go further, not only do we go further, but we go deeper with Him. And maybe you're in a situation right now, right? Where you have a problem, you don't know how to solve it. And maybe the solutions that have been presented to you, and you're like, no, not good. No, not realistic. Uh, I've seen this go down, that's, you know, I, I've seen this happen before, I'm not going to take that. I want you to reevaluate each one of those op options that have come to your, you know, come to you. And I should say, Lord, are you challenging me to go this way? And if so, commit it to prayer and take that step. Because just like he was teaching Philip to go beyond what he was comfortable, he is teaching you and me. Philip grew, he went on to do a lot of great things. And the Lord, is patient with us to grow and to break beyond what it is we are comfortable doing. He is patient and he is faithful because he sees what he saw in the disciple, he sees in us. But can we do that? Can we go beyond what is realistic and comfortable to us? And glory be to God forever, amen. We'll just take a minute to highlight any situation in our lives that we feel that God is really challenging us to change the way that we think about the situation.